métier en, en amont qu'elles ne font pas ou pas bien, et très peu, qui est effectivement d'intervenir en renforcement des fonds propres et notamment dans le cas de, 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 de reprise par des salariés, c'est souvent là où le bas blesse, c'est-à-dire qu'ils ont très peu de disponibilité, ils vont casser, casser leur, leur tiers lire mais ça va faire 3 000, 5 000 euros, euh, même si vous êtes 10 salariés, ça fait 50 000 euros, c'est pas suffisant, donc on va intervenir essentiellement dans le renforcement des fonds propres, en gros pour pouvoir passer de, de, 5, de 50 000 par exemple, à 150 000 euros, on verra demain ou tout à l'heure dans les ateliers un peu le, les montages, de telle sorte à ce que le projet soit structurellement plus, plus fort au niveau euh, financier. Bien sûr, les outils financiers, le, le montage financier, là, ne consiste qu'à faire un effet levier. Donc là, le mouvement n'a pas vocation à subvenir à la totalité des besoins euh, des SCOP. Euh, on serait fort incapable avec, euh, avec les fonds propres de ce collègue. Donc c'est bien un effet levier qui, euh, qui s'exerce entre 15 et 25% de telle sorte à ce qu'on trouve le différentiel euh, dans les, les banques avec des partenariats privilégiés, notamment avec le crédit coopératif. On va poursuivre. Alors, sur le processus euh, juridique de la transmission aux salariés, on a essentiellement deux cas de figure. Je ne suis pas un juriste, je ne suis pas un spécialiste, donc je ne vais pas euh, m'aventurer trop. Mais pour faire très court, on a euh, un processus euh, le plus fréquent qui est la transformation directe avec un nœud, c'est pas grave, de, de l'entreprise en scope. Hein. Et donc là, en fait, euh, on est dans la logique, je dirais, d'une euh, assemblée je dirais, euh, générale de transformation de l'entreprise par entrée de nouveaux euh, actionnaires que sont les salariés et mutation euh, de, euh, je dirais, l'entreprise SARL en général. Euh, et ça, parfois, on se copie. Excusez-moi, excusez on est dans notre jargon. Donc, SARL, c'est Société à Responsabilité Limitée. Donc, on est en général sur des, des, des sociétés de petite taille avec un gérant. Et on a son, euh, son homologue qui est la SCOP ARL, qui, euh, où on aura la même logique, c'est-à-dire euh, des SCOP en général plus petites, hein, de quelques salariés euh, associés qui vont élire en assemblée générale leur gérant. Donc on est sur un mode de gouvernance à circuit très court, hein, assemblée, gérant. Gérant, d'ailleurs, homme ou femme, qui donc rencontre en assemblée de, euh, de, 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 de son exercice de, 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 de gestion d'entreprise. Et euh, il n'y a en général pas de directeur dans ces sociétés-là, elles sont trop petites. Donc le gérant en général une expertise métier, commercial, production, etc. et va en plus être gérant élu, reconnu par ses pairs gérants. Et c'est pour ça que sur les petits projets de reprise ou de transmission en entreprise, il faut qu'on arrive à détecter dans le collectif des salariés qu'on arrive à détecter cette personne qui a un potentiel plus important que, que, que les autres et qui pourra exercer cet exercice de gérance parce que la taille de l'entreprise ne permettra pas d'embaucher un directeur général qui va donc pouvoir apporter une expertise de gestion. Et après les autres cas, c'est essentiellement où on passe par, encore deux minutes, parfait, euh, euh, par la création en fait d'une... On a un double exercice, d'abord la création d'une scope qui d'une manière ou d'une autre, ou rachète le fonds de commerce, ou va servir de holding d'acquisition, ou je veux dire, va euh, être une création à stylo euh, avec accord de l'entreprise individuelle. Ces cas-là, c'est quand euh, ça nécessite de distinguer. Là, il n'y a pas de rupture. La, la transmission se fait euh, en assemblée générale. Là, il y a une création en amont et une cessation de l'entreprise par la suite qui sera d'une manière ou d'une autre intégrée dans la scope qui a repris, euh, repris l'affaire. Voilà, c'est essentiellement les, les, les deux montages juridiques. On va poursuivre, parce que là, on a la poche de, de, de la fin. Euh, nous, on a la diapo d'avant. Euh, là aussi, uniquement pour insister sur cet aspect-là, c'est que le, le processus de transmission est long. Et donc souvent, une fois qu'on a réussi la transmission, je veux dire, euh, on a envie de s'arrêter. Et, 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 et il ne faut surtout pas, parce qu'en fait, il faut veiller à ce qu'il y ait tout un processus d'accompagnement 
de l'entreprise euh, parce que effectivement on ne devient pas euh, co-entrepreneur euh, co comme ça du jour au lendemain, c'est pas parce qu'on a 5000 euros de part sociale qu'on devient co-entrepreneur. Donc il y a tout un dispositif de formation, euh, de formation du dirigeant, on a mis en place notamment des parcours euh, avec euh, un certain nombre d'universités, donc des, par des parcours complets de formation de dirigeants et l'accompagnement de, de l'entreprise tout au long de la vie, puisqu'on a vu ce matin les, les données d'Oseo, on a quand même à peu près 20% de, de pertes en ligne euh, au bout, un peu plus, même de 20% au bout de 6 ans. Donc le but, le but du jeu, c'est d'avoir le moins de défaillances possible. Zéro, c'est difficile, mais le moins possible. Donc l'accompagnement de, 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 de la coopérative est important. Les dernières diapos, qui sont essentiellement nos axes de progrès, c'est-à-dire que pour avoir plus de transmission en scope, on a quelques, comment dirais-je, quelques axes de, 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 de progrès sur lesquels on veut se concentrer. Donc c'est toujours améliorer la, la sensibilisation des cédants, des repreneurs et des, des prescripteurs. Ça c'est un, 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 un axe essentiel. On n'est pas connu. Quand on l'est parfois mal connu, donc il faut continuer sans arrêt à sensibiliser, sensibiliser, sensibiliser. Je vous ai, bon, on a refait tous nos outils de communication, donc des entreprises faites pour ce siècle, et donc on a essayé d'avoir un langage le plus compréhensible possible par des gens qui n'ont pas 20 ans de culture coopérative derrière eux. C'est des études sectorielles, ça c'est très très important, on a des secteurs d'activité qui peuvent, enfin, sur lesquels on a intérêt à aller ou sur lesquels on n'a pas intérêt à aller, par exemple. Et donc, là, aujourd'hui, on a renforcé notre service études pour justement pouvoir mener un certain nombre d'études sectorielles pour savoir définir des cibles plus précisément. Le renforcement de l'accompagnement, avec notamment cette dimension du, du mentorat que vous connaissez bien, et aussi l'évolution du, du montage financier en, en utilisant l'outil le, le, épargne salariale donc là, on est dans des tailles d'entreprise un peu plus significatives. Et donc l'idée, c'est de, de, de travailler en amont de la transmission, euh, à, 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 comment dirais-je, la mise en place d'un plan d'épargne salariale qui est un, un outil assez commun en France, euh, de telle sorte à ce que les salariés disposent, au terme de quelques années, d'une épargne qu'ils pourront utiliser pour reprendre l'entreprise. On en reparlera ultérieurement, mais c'est un processus qui est prometteur, puisque ça représente aussi en France quelques... Euh, dizaines de, de, de milliards, pour ne pas dire davantage, et qui pourraient être utilisés plus significativement pour faciliter les rentre, des reprises d'entreprise de taille significative. Voilà, merci. Merci, Adric. Now, Roy Messing, you remember the presentation of uh, this morning? Of Roy. I uh, leave uh, him the precious minutes to speak to you. Roy. Well, I have my uh, material, my, my brochures as well, so I came prepared for that. Um, I'll take just a little different angle, uh, the approach to this. Uh, one of the things that we look at from a process standpoint, we do have a process that we prescribe similar to what's been mentioned, but we really see it key to get many advisors involved. Um, we really look at this as a team approach. Uh, it's not one person, one entity that needs to discuss this because there's There's a whole variety of issues that need to be covered. So, um, in, in there could be expertise like in attorneys or advocates. Um, as you're going through the process, uh, corporate attorneys fine until you get into you know co-op law. And as we've mentioned before, uh, co-op law really varies between each state and each province. So, uh, you really need to have the right people engaged to make that happen. So, the, the list of people we engage, you know, depending on the complexity, uh, accountants, estate planners financial planners, uh, exit planners, uh, that's what we are. We sort of see ourselves as the quarterback to help through the whole process so it, it gets done. Um, one of the advantages of that is we're a nonprofit, and quite often when you're looking at transitions, the attorneys are very happy to play the quarterback position, uh, but their rates are slightly higher than ours, uh, three, four times maybe. Um, As well, though, depending on, uh, as uh, uh, Patrick mentioned, you know, if there's expertise, or uh, Elaine mentioned, if there's expertise that you need to have, you really need to assess where management at, is at or the remaining folks are at in this process. What skill sets do they need to have? Uh, and co-op developers coming in. Uh, one thing I didn't put on there, but quite often with the mix with family businesses, because that's typically what we deal with, 
is uh, you almost need family counselors at times. You have to bring some people in to address some of those issues where you have uh, divorces or, or people, you know, sons, daughters are in the company, those who are outside the company. So it gets really complex, so you just want to be able to have the right people come in to address this. Uh, we break it up a little differently, too. Uh, from a, At least, ideally, we break it up a little differently. We see, we see the need to have a succession plan before you actually do that transition. Uh, the idea typically is a company, if, if they came to us today, uh, they think they want to sell in the next six months, they're not ready. Uh, there's, there's issues with their companies. Maybe, they, maybe their performance is, isn't where it needs to be to reach their goals. So we typically say maybe one, two, or five years for those companies to really get into a position to transition. So we look at putting that plan in place and then they have a goal to work towards to, you know, be it they want to sell to their employees, uh, you know, they want to sell to the outside. They actually can develop a goal that the, a set of goals that they want to achieve. So this gives them time to do that. Uh, then we actually do the transition, which is a, which is a whole other set. And then uh, the follow-on, everything you need to do afterwards, because uh, typically the members, the, the workers aren't really prepared to carry on a lot of those functions that the owner has held so near and dear to, you know, typically his heart over the years. So you really need to have a lot of training going on. Um, from many aspects, why do you want to look at, uh, you know, planning, doing the planning process? You can determine what risks lie out there and then manage those risks. I'll look at what sort of financial impact you can have. Um, owners are very concerned about control. You can build in controls that they get comfortable with. Uh, you can have flexibility. You may, uh, you may want to take some of your assets out of the company, like uh, real estate assets, buildings, that sort of thing. From a tax planning standpoint, at least in the States, I don't know how it is in Canada, um, you may want to lease that to the company going forward and get to income that is considered unearned income, so you don't get in, you get taxed on it, but you don't get uh, what they, we would call social, uh, I guess it's a, the payroll tax. There's no payroll tax applied, so it's at a lower rate. So there's real real management tools you can you can accomplish this, and as well that usually makes a transaction, at least when you're first transitioning, uh, more achievable because you don't have such a high level of assets you need to finance. Uh, obviously, we talked about value. You need to uh, determine what the value of the company is, and that can have a whole range of meanings depending on who's who's looking at that. And primarily for the owner, it's a life change. They need to put a plan in place to say, "Okay, now when I when I sell my company to my uh, my employees, and then I go and spend every day with my wife, you know, what's she going to do with me? Or what am I going to do with me?" So they have to have some time to plan through what they want to do. And I, I know it's chauvinistic, but typically it's it's the uh, you know the male who's been in charge for how many years. Although we do run into you know female organizations, so but typically it, it's the guy, and we really don't know what that dynamic is. Uh, the process, uh, as Ben mentioned, uh, you know, goal setting. What does the business owner want to achieve, or owners? What do they want to achieve? You know, they have to have a vision of what their company is worth. Uh, a lot of them think, okay, I'm going to. Uh, you know, I'm going to retire. I'm going to move down to Florida and live on the beach. Um, and so they start doing this process. So here's here's what my goals are. Here's what sort of financial uh, life I want to live. And probably as I as I was talking uh, earlier, um, you know, the business owner typically when they're looking at it, if you ask them what their company's worth, it's always up here because they know it better than anybody else. But in reality, it's somewhere down here. And that's one of the reasons why we go through the goal setting because if they think it's up here and they're going to get that, it, you know, it may be an adjustment that they're not going to get as many, you know, as much money out of it. So that's another reason to give them a couple of years to plan so they can get more out of it if they need to. Uh, obviously, as Ben's mentioned, the goal setting for other stakeholders, uh, uh, vendors, uh, you know, people you're buying supplies from, people you're selling to, uh, employees, everybody else who's, who's engaged, you want to make sure those goals are determined because um, you know, quite often we'll run into, uh, it, with this and we're talking about family, it's, okay, I'm going to sell to my son. And you know, the son may sit there and say, uh -uh, I've seen you work yourself into the ground. And, you know, I don't want any part of that life, thank you very much. So you wanna make sure you really, really understand you know, what the goals of everybody engaged in will be. Um, critical as well, management succession. Uh, if, if the owner has a certain set of skills, that nobody else has, 
uh, in you assess and nobody else is really evident can, can uh, acquire those skills, you may have to go outside the company to bring somebody in during that transition period. Uh, they try to determine what, what the best case scenario is. Quite often, uh, as has been mentioned before, uh, they may want to sell to their employees, but the culture might not be there. The employees may not want to buy it. So you may not have the best uh, outcome you know, selling to the workers. And that's better to determine up front and a lot of the no, go and no-go situations, we work through that. Uh, so you explore all the options, and once you have the planning pl plan in place, you actually implement it. Um, owners are great for spending a lot of money on things and then taking it and putting it up on the shelf. You know, they got a good plan, but they want to achieve your goals, you implement that plan. Uh, some of the tools, I uh, think these have been mentioned a bit, but the valuation, obviously that sets the price. It's a third party, comes in independent, sets the price. Uh, more from keeping it from the family, there's a lot of uh, things you can do to minimize that transition, gifting the shares, uh, developing trust. That doesn't work so well for the employees because, uh, at least in the states, the IRS sees that as compensation. So they, they'll actually you know, have a tax bill for that. So uh, that's strictly internal. Uh, we look at as well management buyouts. You know, this, this is the whole range that they go through. And what we like to educate people when we're going through this process is, you know, this is an option you need to consider. So we'll work with a lot of people and they really haven't considered it, so it's another way to work through that. Um, and then if none of these options work out, you know, okay, if you want to sell your company, what's the outside opportunity? So we'll look that way as well. And in worst case, it's liquidation. Nobody wants to go there. Some of the tools as we work on, again, uh, really if you're going to go to the worker, worker co-op model or employee model, employee ownership model that we have, is really that initial assessment. Um, we like to go out to the businesses. Um, yeah, usually they're they're pretty uh, they're pretty tough. At, they don't want somebody out there and uh, allow their employees to ask questions about you know what was that person here for because they get get a little suspicious. But when when at all possible, we like to go out to the business, get a little sense of what's going on there. You can you can walk through a company and say you know are the uh, are is the equipment wired together uh, rather than you know working. Um, working the way it should, you really get a sense if there's uh, maintenance issues or other issues involved. Uh, and that's critical because maybe everything's going fine, but you may have to do a lot of upgrading of that equipment or that facility if, if, they have, if the owner has sort of milked it. Um, and as well, we look at uh, pre-feasibility study. That's where we'll look more at overall, looking at you know what's the financial condition, what's the market situation. Uh, if, if it's transitioned to the workers, is this really going to work? Does it have a good opportunity to work? Uh, appropriate culture review. We really talk about a um, you know open book culture. We want to make sure that people are really engaged, engaged with it. If you go out and you get the sense that uh, you know the, that the workers have never had an understanding of what the financing is like, anything about the company, and the um, the owner says uh, you know comes and announces after they do all this work. You know, great news! I'm gonna I'm going to uh, transition the company. You're going to be an owner. Uh, they're usually pretty suspicious when that's announced because you know, okay, what's he sticking with me now? So we want to make sure that that there's culture and opportunity where people will really uh, really be able to take over. Again, looking at the management uh, or yeah, management capability is that is that you know uh, really there? And the business plan is really from a transition standpoint of okay. Once we're going to get through this, here's how we tactically move forward and implement all these changes. Some of the advantages to the uh, owner, what we call legacy. Um, if you're in a rural community and uh, you know the owner has his has his nice house, his nice life, and he wants to sell a company to somebody down the road, he still has to live in that community. All the cousins and uh, everybody, everybody who, all the neighbors know who he is and what he did. So. A lot of a lot of the work we do is really talk about that legacy. A lot of people do want, you know, they created that legacy in the area and they want to sustain that. Uh, stage sales allows for uh, the owner to get comfortable over a period of time that, okay, uh, this is going the way it should. Typically, the sales go something like 30%. Um, within the states, 30% the goes to the employees because that uh, it acts tax benefit with some tax gains or uh, tax deferral. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later if we have time. Uh, but usually it goes 30, 49, and then the balance goes to the employee. So there's a period of time where you have this transition and people get comfortable. 
Um, and I think even more today, looking at different alternatives, the way to structure it. Like I said before, taking the real estate out, uh, it may make an easier transac uh, transaction. Uh, it might help uh, from a tax standpoint for the owner. Uh, you can do that with having like a, a, a lease with a uh, uh, buy option from the, from the workers to buy it at a later date. So it really makes it more of a manageable transaction. Okay. Uh, advantages to the uh, to the buyers, workers. Obviously, they retain their job, but they're doing a lot more than that. They gain control of their career. Um, you know, they re receive equity in the company, so they're actually getting compensated for for their work. Um, quite often, um, if they have to buy in. If they buy into the company through, uh, if they don't have cash to buy in their membership, quite often the company can loan that to them and then deduct that out of a payroll deduction over a period of time. Uh, we see a lot of uh, expanded capabilities uh, for the uh, the workers themselves. You know, once they get a sense of I'm in control, they're willing to learn more and, and really do more at the company. Uh, it maintains the uh, community and really gives them more job flexibility. So the big question that that when we're going through this transition uh, that's been mentioned, you know, can we have a co-op? Do we have a willing buyer and a willing seller? And really, a lot of those issues are addressed. Where does everybody get comfortable with this this transition, this transaction? Um, you can go forward. Uh, some of those some of those uh, when you're structuring the business, when you're actually uh, moving it over, uh, you have to have key decisions. You know. Uh, how are you going to work with, uh, especially in a transition period where you're not selling 100%, how do you address those issues? How do you get everybody comfortable? You know, the owner doesn't want to give it all up and not have some control and say, oh, the employees can you know, go out and sell this out from underneath me. So you address all those uh, issues through the agreements that you determine. Uh, funding's usually a, a large issue, and usually with uh, working at this, this uh, transition, you can get outside funding since it is an existing company, it's got a good, good business model, uh, you're only selling 30%, usually can go out to banks or other groups and help get that funding secured. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of legal issues, again, bringing in the uh, co-op attorneys who understand this. Uh, address your management succession. Uh, and again, with the transition period, you may have somebody assigned in there who you think, this person can take over that role. Um, you can make it three years into it, and that's not the person. So the owner may still have to be engaged and find a second person. Um, the offering statement really outlines the total details of the uh, of the uh, transaction to the to the employees. Uh, with that, though, there's a lot of communication because typically uh, they're not going to be very comfortable or knowledgeable to look at a document that may be you know 50 pages long. So you need to communicate that and provide them with the with the uh, comfort so that they can agree to move forward. Uh, the employees uh, approve the transaction, and then you have to go in, you have to adjust the articles of incorporation. Uh, the bylaws will really dictate how the company will uh, move going forward. And then you're going to talk about governance. How are we going to govern this? Um, loan covenants, that's really going to dictate uh, within the deal. The deal is actually the transition you're signing on the, on the line. Um, loan covenants are outlined how from, the, from outside how, how you can operate the business, the bank will determine that. Uh, you'll actually transition where the co-op will buy the stock from the uh, seller, you have all the agreements signed, and then uh, you'll turn around and sell the stock to the uh, employees. And you sign the deal, you close it. Uh, members' rights and responsibilities. Obviously, uh, not all of them come in to join the co-op, but there's uh, certain requirements they have to have. They have to participate financially and operationally, uh, they'll have a chance from board selection, they'll actually select who the board is, I guess this is sort of creation required. Um, one of the transitions period pieces though, in that board selection, typically the owners are going to have some caveats in there so they, so they don't lose control of the company. Um, I have, obviously you're going to work with, you know, how do you revolve, the, revolve some of those benefits to the workers once they're in there, you don't want to burden the company. Um, and if you're a growing company, you have to determine, okay, we're going to take out new employees. They're going to become you know, worker owners at some point in time. How do you want to select them? So you have to set that. 
uh, and then you work with the uh, uh, retirement as well. How do you how you transition it? I think one of the items was mentioned. Yeah, if everybody in the co-op uh, when you join is 50 years old, and you don't get any new members, you have a real issue because five, 10, 15 years down the road, everybody's going to want to retire. So you have to address that. Um, training is a big thing with us. Really looking at culture, communication, basic financial education, so everybody gets comfortable with that. Uh, addressing management needs if possible. And then committees, you don't have to go forward. Committees, um, really set up committees to address issues as they come up. Uh, you know, if you need another committee on a uh, very specific pro uh, problem, uh, form a committee and take care of that. But get all the players engaged. I guess you can go to our contact information. Uh, this is different resources you can connect. Uh, USDA does a lot uh, in America. Uh, just. Uh, co-ops, uh, the Vermont Center as well as us, Federation of Worker Co-ops Canadian. Uh, this is a group, the EPI is a group that actually uh, is a nonprofit organization that focuses on exit planning. And they're really developing a process of getting everybody engaged. And that's our contact information. Thank you, Rob. Oh, I forgot my plug. Uh, like everybody else, uh, we have two books, uh, An Owner's Guide to Succession Planning. Um, it's not in French translation, sorry. And then selling to your uh, selling to your uh, bis your business to your employees, either a worker co-op or an ESOP. So if you want to peruse through these, I'll leave them up here. And then uh, if you want one, just contact me. Thank you. Cool. Merci. Pour la période d'échange, faciliter la traduction simultanée. Si vous avez une question ou un commentaire, vous demanderez de lever la main. Je vais vous Oui, voilà. Euh, ben, je peux poser ma question comme ça. Non, mais c'est parce que la traduction, c'est le dernier pour ne ah, pas se faire en même temps. Approchez-vous. Je vais pas l'en faire. Le bruit de votre corps. Oui, c'est ça. Voilà. Non. Comment identifier les sédents? Quels sont les mécanismes qu'on a? Parce que je crois que c'est la partie la plus difficile. Quels mécanismes mettons en place pour identifier les sédents? Puis j'ai une autre question, excusez-moi, c'est un deux pour un. Oui, oui. Euh, Quelqu'un a parlé du plan d'épargne salariale, je crois que c'est vous. Où vont les fonds, puisqu'on les cumule avant l'acquisition d'une nouvelle entreprise? Par, euh, donc, qu'est-ce qu'on fait avec les fonds? Comment on gère ce fonds-là? Alors, comme on n'a pas beaucoup de temps, je vous accorde un petit temps chacun pour la première question. Et vous répondrez à la seconde en même temps, vu que c'était vous qu'on l'adresse. OK. Bon, rapidement, euh, sur, euh, sur les cédants, il n'y a, a pas de recette miracle. C'est vraiment un, un, un travail de, je dirais de, de longue haleine et, et à faire dans la durée avec deux éléments, euh, pour moi, clés. Le premier, c'est euh, ce qu'on a appelé les prescripteurs ou les conseillers de confiance. Et il faut vraiment, enfin, je veux dire, je, je redis ce que j'ai dit ce matin, le cédant va céder une fois dans sa vie, le repreneur va reprendre une fois. Donc, vous imaginez l'investissement colossal qu'il faut faire pour un fusil à un coup. Donc, il faut absolument essayer de déplacer cet investissement sur les prescripteurs qui, eux, vont le faire dix fois, cent fois, voire encore davantage. Donc, c'est un travail long et patient. Donc, dans les prescripteurs, on a les chambres consulaires, chambres de commerce ou chambres de métier chez nous, pourquoi pas chambres d'agriculture également. On a les banques et on a tout ce qu'on peut mettre dans les conseillers d'affaires, avocats, notaires, conseillers juridiques, etc. etc. Pour moi, c'est la première piste. Et la deuxième, c'est qu'il euh, n'y a pas meilleur, euh, comment dirais-je, euh, euh, prescripteur de la session qu'un cédant qui a réussi sa session au salarié. Et donc, là, nous, ce qu'on fait beaucoup, c'est des réunions publiques avec des cédants. C'est-à-dire, pour euh, parler à des cédants, dire, on peut leur raconter tout ce qu'on veut, on est un peu suspect. Parce que nous, on a forcément un intérêt dans la chose. Alors qu'un cédant, et donc je, je le disais, ben je ne sais plus ton prénom, mais je te disais ce matin une toute petite anecdote. Euh, on a fait une intervention avec un cédant qui a tout simplement expliqué comment on avait repris son entreprise. Et quelqu'un a posé une question en disant, mais combien vous avez vendu la, votre entreprise de salariés La personne a dit 2 millions d'euros. L'autre dit, 2 millions d'euros Vos salariés avaient 2 millions d'euros. Et c'est là où le cédant a, a pris conscience. Il a dit, non, les salariés n'avaient pas 2 millions d'euros. Mais on a, on a ensemble réussi à faire un tour de table de 2 millions d'euros. Ce qui veut dire que des cédants qui ont été dans des affaires pendant parfois 30 ans de leur vie, 
confonde prix de cession et, par exemple, capital importé par l'entreprise. Les salariés ont importé 200 millions, ce qui est déjà pas mal. Hein. Je dire, entre 200 et 2 millions. Et donc, vous voyez tout à l'heure que les 200 000 euros sont devenus 400 000 euros par les outils du mouvement qui nous ont permis, qui permettent de prêter aux salariés. Ces 400 000 sont devenus 800 000 par l'intervention au renforcement de fonds propres. Et après, les banquiers ont, ont, ont fait la différence, euh, je dirais, en important les 1 million 200 000. Que ce soit au clair, c'était une très belle affaire. Elle valait les 2, les 2 millions, sinon on n'aurait pas tenté l'aventure. Donc voilà, première réponse. Deuxième réponse. Après, vite, vite. Voilà. Alors bon, là, je vais essayer d'aller vite. En, en France, euh, il y a un, un outil d'épargne salariale qui est géré à l'extérieur des, des, des entreprises. D'accord euh, Et donc, par des... des des, des fonds de gestion d'épargne salariale, dont le plus important est une filiale euh, d'une banque euh, coopérative, même si elle a fait quelques excès euh, avec l'une de ses filiales, elle est euh, revenue à de plus sages préoccupations. Hein, et effectivement, ces fonds donc, sont complètement enfin, sécurisés autant euh, qu'il qu est possible, puisque si cet argent restait dans l'entreprise, le risque majeur, c'est que si l'entreprise défaille, le, le, le salarié perd son, son épargne. Et donc là, il est traité par ailleurs avec deux intérêts majeurs. Le premier, c'est que l'entreprise, les salariés ont peu de fonds malgré tout. Je dire, épargne salariale, ce n'est pas des millions. Donc ils ont un petit plan d'épargne. Sauf que le fonds lui gère, euh, je ne sais plus, enfin, c'est en, en, en dizaines, en centaines de milliards d'euros. Donc vous voyez, et, au, et on a une loi en France qui euh, fait que les fonds d'épargne salariale doivent obligatoirement investir 5% de leur fonds géré dans des entreprises de l'économie sociale, les scopes étant des entreprises de l'économie sociale, vous voyez le, le, le montant qu'on est capable de mobiliser qui est infiniment plus important que ce que les salariés sont capables d'économiser dans la plan d'épargne individuelle. C'est notre règle pour la fin de suite. Uh, anything else for the, the first question? Oh. Um. As far as the financing piece, it is a big issue to transition that, but let's use the $2 million that uh, Patrick mentioned. And what we typically do is we, we have these stage sales. So, uh, so anyway, so you may start out, may start out the sales price is $2 million. If you're selling 30%, you only have to come up with 600,000. And so it, it cuts down the transaction to more of a manageable situation. Oh, he probably needs me back here. Sorry. Sorry. So you start out $2 million. Uh, I should have done sign language, but I don't know that either. Uh, but if you do a 30% transaction, it's, uh, it's cut down to 600,000. You can go to a bank typically. If you can get 600,000, then you can move forward with the transaction. If you can't, uh, we would tap groups like our loan fund to help find that difference. So our loan fund can do up to 250,000. So we'll team up with banks or other groups such as community development financial institutions you know, to bring enough dollars to the table to make that happen. So we find that it's much easier doing it and, and it works uh, within our, our, the way we deal. Uh, it works with that transition so people are more comfortable. Uh, one thing to add, Uh, the transition as well, banks are very uh, uh, leery of, okay, the employees are going to take over the business. Uh, if you do a stage transfer, you have the old owner is still engaged for a period of time, and it gives them the opportunity to experience what the business, the new business owners can do, and they gain comfort in that. 